Hi, welcome back Anatomy students. I am here today to help you review for your upcoming tests. So in this chapter, we learned all about the skeletal system. We learned about its macroscopic anatomy, its microscopic anatomy. We learned functions. Uh, so let's start with the five functions of the skeletal system. First of all, hopefully you recognize that it provides you support, right? This skeleton here is holding you up. It also provides you protection, so all of your vital organs need something hard outside of them to save you from any kind of mechanical type injury. They aid in movement because muscles connect to bones, and then when muscles pull on bones, bones move. They store, what do they store? They store a number of minerals and fats, and they also produce blood cells. So this process is called hematopoiesis, which happens in the red blood cells. Looking at the microscopic anatomy of bone, you have two different types of bone tissue. You have cancellous tissue, which is also called spongy bone, that's up here in pink, and you have compact bone, which is also called dense, and that is down here more in the whitish gray color. Now these pictures are different than I put on my review because on a test, I usually give different pictures than what you practice with. So I didn't want to give you the exact same thing I gave you on a review. So you should be able to recognize things by their descriptions. So first of all, the cancellous tissue, where you have the more solid pink, that's the actual bone tissue. So that's the matrix that creates bone. And then the spaces in between that's white with a bunch of pink dots, that's gonna be the actual bone marrow cavity. So this is where you find your bone marrow. Um, for us, we would wanna recognize that the shape of the matrix comes in a trabeculae, and then the cells are found inside of lacuna, just like they are in compact bone. So here, this little divot, if you will, with a dot inside of it, that is the lacuna with an osteocyte inside. So osteoblasts, you might remember on the surface, I'm not going to ask you that, but that's what you have here. Over here you have can, or compact bone, so we know that because we have these rings of osteon, and so that's a lot easier to identify. So looking here, the whole set is an osteon, each individual ring is a lamella, and then you have the central canal down the center that carries the main blood vessels. All of the dots on the outside, those dots are your osteocytes. They kind of look like spiders, and they're sitting in lacuna, and there's tiny little cracks, which is why this appears gray instead of white. Those little cracks are canaliculi. So basically, the overall description, cancellous tissue is found in trabeculae, or the matrix is formed in trabeculae, and it's very porous. We see that at the ends of the long bone. We also see it on the very inside before you get to the medullary canal. And then the compact bone, those matrix, that matrix is arranged in lamella, the circles, and the circles are arranged in an even more organized fashion in osteons, and then that tissue is much more dense. So in this picture, you can see it on the outside of the bone, which is where you typically would find the compact bone because it provides more protection. So the diagram of the long bone is what I will ask students to do. You've already made a model of your own bone with all kinds of different material. Um, you should also recognize descriptions of each of these things because they could show up in a multiple choice question. Now for me, I'm going to want you to label eight structures. I don't care which eight you label, but you need to label eight. So you have your two epiphyses. I'm going to count that as one. If you really were able to differentiate by shape, you would have the proximal epiphysis, usually um, that rounded head if you're doing the humerus or the femur, which is usually what we're drawing, and you have the condyle at the distal end. In between, the whole shaft is called the diaphysis. You have the medullary canal on the inside. The canal has a lining itself, and that's called endosteum. And then it's filled with yellow marrow, and the yellow marrow contains a large number of fat cells. That's why it appears yellow. And then we have the ends of the long bone that contain the compact bone, I'm sorry, cancellous bone in the ends of the long bone. And that contains red marrow. So you would want to differentiate between red marrow and just spongy bone. Um, the red marrow is red because it has blood vessels in various stages of development. Actually, it makes all of your different blood cells, um, but the red blood cells is what gives it its characteristic name. 
He had the epiphyseal plate or line, depending on the age of the bone. And then on the outside of the compact bone, you have the periosteum, so the outer covering. And then um, draw that, label eight things. I'm not a good drawer, I understand if you're not. It doesn't have to be artwork, but that's how I'm gonna grade you. There's a number of different cells that we studied this chapter, osteoprogenitor. They are stem cells, sometimes you hear them called mesenchymal cells. Mesenchymal cells can become any type of connective tissue, so depending on the hormonal signal or the neighboring cells can give signals, they differentiate into different types of cells. So an osteoprogenitor, osteo bone, pro before generation, genesis, creation. So before the bone, you have the osteoprogenitor, it will make osteoblasts. Osteoblasts are your bone forming cells. They produce the matrix. They're usually found in the endo, endosteum and in the periosteum. And they can be triggered by the hormone calcitonin. So calcitonin, when there is plenty of calcium in the blood, triggers osteoblasts to take that calcium out of the blood and put it into the bone tissue. Osteocytes, those are your mature cells, so they've been buried in matrix, they're no longer secreting it. And then the osteoclasts, those are the bone destroying cells. So they're triggered by a different hormone, they're triggered by parathyroid hormone. When the blood, pH, or when the blood calcium levels are too low, they'll trigger, um, this hormone will trigger osteoclasts to start breaking down bone. Osteoclasts are also used in remodeling of bone. So let's say if you had a bone injury, we have to get rid of the old tissue so the osteoclast will break that down and then osteoblasts will produce more tissue to repair it. So they work together that way. Speaking of calcium levels, if your calcium levels are too low, you might get porous bones. So the word osteoporosis literally means porous bones. Here you can see a nice healthy bone and then here you see one that does not have as much tissue, right? Because it doesn't have as many minerals in its uh, matrix. So this would be an osteoporotic bone, which makes it easy to break. So what we've covered in our class simply is a low level of calcium can trigger osteoporosis. But you can see in this graphic, there's some other things like alcohol use, um, estrogen levels, smoking, um, a sedentary, sedentary lifestyle. So if you just sit around, like actually working out puts stress on your bones which triggers your bones to make matrix so that's how it compensates for that stress so actually doing some work with weights can help your bones so ossification can be tricky or you can simplify it I'm kind of somewhere in between the two basically you know you have a cartilage model and it's replaced by bone now how does that happen so first you have your cartilage model, and then the periosteum, the outer covering of bone, connective tissue forms first. So that's going to cover the whole cartilage model. And once the periosteum is there, remember, that's where I find my osteoblasts. So the osteoblasts are going to start making matrix, and so that's going to start to cover the cartilage. Now once you got this bony tissue, blood can't just go through that tissue anymore, so the cartilage is going to start to die, actually. So the cartilage in the center will start to die because that's furthest from the path of diffusion of blood because you don't have a blood supply yet. So that primary first ossification, making bone center, will occur in the center of the long bones. And osteoclasts are going to help out by eating up the cartilage that is in the inside, thus creating the medullary canal. Now vessels are going to start to penetrate through, so you see the nutrient artery that you put in your models, that the vessel will penetrate through, and that'll go into the inner cavity, and the inner cavity, um, it'll start stimulating the osteoblasts that are in the endosteum. So they're gonna start to make spongy bone and trabeculae on the inside, while the bone continues to elongate, it stretches and it creates that long medullary canal that is down the center of the bone. On top of that, since blood is bringing nutrients, blood is bringing hormones that tell cells what to do, vessels start to grow up that medullary canal and into the epiphyses. So it all starts in the center and it works its way out. So once it's in the epiphyses, the ends of the bone, the same process is occurring um, where we're going to start to trigger the osteoblast, they're going to start to make spongy bone in your secondary ossification center. So that's as complicated as I'm going to make it. There are many sites you can check it out and get 
uh, videos of animations and um, tutorials and just read about it. And I think that helps you understand it. I do think pictures are rather necessary to understand a process. So in my class, the kids had to draw a sequence of ossification in their notebooks. So here you can see the cartilage model. You see the um, nutrient artery begins to penetrate and now osteoblasts are going to start making bone cells and osteoclasts are gonna start breaking down the cartilage cell. So here this is breaking down of cartilage cells. The blood vessels continues into that central cavity. Now you can see the cartilage is being changed by bone because notice the difference in colors. Brown is bone and blue is cartilage. So that begins to make more and more um, bone while the bone is getting longer, longer, and longer, and the vessel is moving towards the epiphyses. So we hollow out the inside, and then we start on the ends, and we make them bone as well. The epiphyseal plate is for linear bone growth. Here you have two different bones. One is still growing, one is not. Can you determine which one is? Notice the opening here in the epiphysis. So that one is still growing. So this is the epiphyseal plate. And after puberty, hormones will signal the ossification of this area, and you will be left with an epiphyseal line. So at this point, you can no longer grow any taller. I mentioned calcitonin already. When the blood has plenty of calcium, calcitonin signals osteoblasts to put that calcium into the matrix. Well, PTH is kind of the opposite. PTH is going to be signaling the bones to strip the bone of calcium. So both PTH and vitamin D have to do with calcium levels in the blood. PTH causes the calcium to come out of the bones. Vitamin D is used for the absorption of calcium from the intestines. So if we can absorb it from the intestines, it's going to go directly into the blood. Now, if I get plenty of blood through my, or calcium through my intestines, I'm going to have the excess calcium, and that calcium is going to get stored into my bones. So that's why we connect vitamin D with strong bones. Um, PTH is going to be signaled, that's the parathyroid hormone. Over here you have this parathyroid. Um, this whole structure actually is the thyroid, and then you have four dots. Those are the parathyroid. They're going to release PTH when the blood or serum levels are low and then that triggers the osteoclast to start breaking down matrix and then that's going to release calcium into the blood. So we've talked about the entire skeleton and we've divided it into two sections. The skull, the bony thorax, and the vertebral column are your axial skeleton. Their job is simply to protect. They protect vital organs like your heart and lungs and your brain and your sense organs. They also allow articulation or adjoining of the appendicular skeleton. So the appendicular skeleton, your arms, your legs, they're connected to your bones via tendons and the appendicular skeleton, rather than being the job of protection, its job is simply movement. So that's the difference between the two functions of those skeletons. There's four different types of bone. So now I'm not talking about tissue microscopically, but bone macroscopically or gross. And they're characteristic according to how their bone is arranged, how the bone tissue, and according to their shapes. So first of all, you have short bones. Short bones are typically the same length as they are width-ish. They're cuboidal in shape. They have a thin layer of compact on the outside, and then they're filled with cancellous tissue. So to me, these have a little bit more um, compressibility, if you will. The long bones are longer than they are wide. These are the ones that you think of in your fingers and toes and arms and legs. And they have, as we've described, plenty, the epiphysis being filled with cancellous tissue and a thin layer of compact on the outside. And then the diaphysis, the long part, is full of compact bone on the outside and then a thin layer of cancellous on the inside. And then you have irregular bones, which don't have any particular shape. So like your vertebrae, that's pretty irregular. And they're arranged similar to short bones in that they have a thin layer of compact on the outside and then filled with cancellous tissue. And then you have flat bones. Flat bones are usually where you need protection. They produce an armor. So in our skull, um, in our thorax, in our 
pelvic girdle. We have broad sheets of bones, and it's kind of like a sandwich of cancellous tissue on the inside and compact bone on the outside. So for bones, you should recognize their scientific description. That's what you received in your lecture. That's what you read from a book. You should also be able to picture a skeleton in your head and be able to connect scientific terms to your common language. So your shoulder blade is your scapula. Your collarbone is your clavicle. The forehead is your frontal bone. Your chin is part of your mandible, but the term for chin is mental. So we talked about the mental foreman. The breastbone is the sternum, the ankles are the tarsals, the wrists are your carpals, the hips is your ilium, and the thigh is your femur. That's a lot of the, the common names that we use and the scientific names that connect to them. So we did a forensics activity that was kind of fun and we had to identify if bones were from males or females, if they were old or young, and we had to try to figure out who belonged to who. So um, one of the things on my test you'll have to do is do some of that mathematical calculation. The formulas are provided for you so you don't have to memorize them. You just have to know how to plug numbers in. So we did that in class. Um, you also need to recognize just some general ways of how you can tell the difference between a male and female skeleton. So it's easiest to look at the pelvis. A lot of you identified that. And that the male is, um, the, the pubic symphysis is less than 90 degrees and the female is greater than 90 degrees. We can look at the inlet here or outlet, and you can see that the female is much wider and rounder, and the male is, is more narrow. And because its sacrum is pointed forward, it often appears to be heart-shaped, whereas uh, the female appears to be circular. So, so the sacrum is another thing you can look at. The sacrum points back for the female, front for the male, and then you can also try to find some differences in the skull. Basically, the female skull is more gracile or graceful and the male is more robust. So you can look at the angle of the jaw, the female is obtuse, the male is 90 degrees. You can look at the brow ridges. Women like, you know, to, to do their eyebrows. So think the um, occipital margins are more sharp for the female, which is kind of accentuated by our makeup, but our brow ridges are more soft and the male is more prominent. The male has much more muscle lines on their scal scar, <laughs> on their skull than the female. Um, and then the female has a much rounder jaw and the male is more square. We use the breakfast times, seven for breakfast, 12 for lunch, five for dinner as numerical mnemonics <laughs> for remembering how many bones there are in each section of the vertebrae. So the cervical seven, the neck, the thoracic, which is chest area, you have 12, the lumbar, the lower back is five, and then you have a sacrum, which is a number of fused bones, and you have the coccyx, which is a number of fused bones. So as an adult, you have 26 bones in your vertebral column, but before these two bottom sections are fusing, they're all individual bones in the formation. So before birth, you actually have 33 bones in your vertebral column. And you're curled up in a ball, so you have these primary curves that that kind of identify that ball that you were in, in the womb. So the thoracic and the sacral curves are primary curves. And then after you were born and you had to learn to hold your head up and it got heavy and it started like pulling on your vertebrae backwards, you got this secondary curve called the cervical curve. And then as you got a little bit older, you tried to walk, and then your body was heavy, and then that started leaning back, and that created the secondary curve in your lumbar region. So those are a couple of the changes that happened to your vertebrae after you were born. Sticking with the vertebrae, we have five specific markings that we looked at. The spinous process sticks out the back, and it provides attachment site for muscles and ligaments of the back. The articular process, you have two going up and two going down. I'm looking down on this particular vertebrae so you don't see the inferior articular cartilage, but they form interlocking joints with each of the vertebrae going up and going down. Um, you have the vertebral body, which is the supporting part of the vertebral vertebrae, and then you have the transverse process. They stick out the sides. Again, attachment of ligaments and muscles of the back. Also in the thoracic region, it's attachment of rib. And then you have the vertebral foramen. All foramens are holes. The vertebral foramen allows passageway of the spinal cord. Pretty important. 
We have a couple foramen that are special to us. First of all, you have the mental foramen. There's little holes in this chin. Um, and that is where the dentist is going to numb your jaw. The nerves that are going through your um, mental foramen allow him to do that. And then the magnum foramen, which is the largest of your foramen, it is a passageway for your spinal cord to connect with your brain stem. So that is hugely important. Um, so then in the temporal bone back here, we have a number of special features. This guy's supposed to circle, and then I would be able to show you these all at the same time, but it's not doing it. So um, in the temporal bone, you have the mastoid process that sits behind your ear. You can feel that bump. You have the external auditory canal. Maybe you used your Q-tip there this morning. And then the styloid process is an attachment for all the parts of your ear. So those are kind of cool things to identify. All right, we're starting to get into the hodgepodge of the review sheet. Um, so the scientific name for the thumb and for the big toe. The thumb is the pollux, I think. Thumbs up, Polly. And the big toe is called the hallux, and I think hammer tome, hallux. So those are my mnemonics. You have the sternum or breastbone, and there's three parts to it. The manubrium is up top. So to me, this looks like a tie, and who wears a tie? Usually a man. So the top part is a man, ubrium. And then you have the body and the xiphoid process down here that is... Um, something you're going to look out for when you're giving CPR. You want to go two fingers down below so you don't accidentally break that thing off. You have 12 pairs of ribs total. Seven of them are true. Those up here have a direct connection. Those next three are false, so seven and three is 10. And then the bottom two are floating. They have no connection, and so they're called the floating ribs. They have no anterior connection. In this unit, I like numbers, names, and claims to fame. So, um, identifying the claims to fame of a few of the bones that we pointed out. The lumbar, they support the weight of your body. The hyoid is not connected to any other bone. The lacrimal bone is the tiniest bone in your face. That's where your pterodocs are. And the femur, as you might know, is the longest, strongest bone of your body. Joints, joints, joints. Why are they so important? Well, one, they allow us to move. And two, they hold our bones together. They are um, going to be identified according to their structure and of their function. So one of the structures is a synovial capsule. So the purpose of the synovial capsule is to maintain the joint integrity, basically. It protects it in all ways, it supports it, and it provides synovial fluid for friction uh, reduction. So the different synovial joints we talked about were the pivot joint where one bone rotates about another bone. The hinge joint moves in a single plane. The saddle joint, which is only found in my thumb, and the ball and socket joint, pretty familiar with that at your shoulder and hip, moves in 360 degrees. You have the condyloid joint, knuckle-like projection is condyle, right? So I find these in my knuckles. And they move my fingers up, down, side to side. And I got gliding or planar joints in my wrists and my ankles that allow my bones to slide over one another. The skull has non-moving joints, they're called sutures. And when the sutures have not fused yet, you have these parts that are still cartilage. Go back to that ossification process, right? So before you're bone, born, these sutures need to be able to kind of slide past each other in order to fit through the birth canal. So they are not ossified all of the way when you're born. So the baby has a soft spot. The soft spot is called the fontanelle. So you're, you've probably been told to be very, very careful of his head because it's still soft. And that's where it's still in the process of ossification. Ligaments and tendons are both part of your joint. The tendon is attached to the muscle. So the muscle is pulling on the bone via the tendon to produce movement. The ligament is holding the bones to bones. So you have usually ligaments on all four sides of your synovial joints to keep um, the bones basically in alignment. And then, kind of off topic, but that was the order of our review sheet, um, differentiate between the true and false ribs. The true ribs have a direct connection to the sternum. So their cartilage here is directly attached to the sternum. Whereas the false ribs down here, their cartilage has to attach to another cartilage before attaching to the sternum. So they're considered to have an indirect attachment. Again, just reviewing your notes is going to be helpful for this. You've done coloring sheets. You've written all kinds of notes to yourself. You should know axial for an appendicular skeleton. The 80 bones that make up your axial skeleton are in blue here. Your skull, your thorax, and your vertebral column. 
everything else in yellowish, <laughs> everything else is your appendicular skeleton. So in our book, Table 5-1 has all of your bone, bone markings. You can check those out. Projections allow for attachments of muscles, ligaments, tendons, other bones. Depressions allow for passageway or they make the groove of a joint. So um, you want to be familiar with some specific ones. For us, we want to know the crest, which is a, a narrow ridge. And we did a warm-up with this just recently. Um, we did a spine, which is a spinous process. The head, which is the rounded articular surface. The neck is a narrowing from that head. The condyle, a knuckle-like projection. Jump down to fossa, which is a narrow groove. The foramen, which is a hole for passageway of blood vessels and nerves. A meatus is a canal through bone. And um, a sinus is a membrane-filled cavity. So those are the ones that we emphasize in my class. And those are the ones you'll see on your test. In my class, the part that the kids have the most trouble with on the test is recognizing scientific descriptions of bones related to the face and the cranium. So you want to go back to your lecture notes and review those and read them scientifically. From that, you should be able to get a mental image and then you picture the pictures that you've been looking at, right? Our brain likes pictures. So to say like the sphenoid is the keystone bone of the skull or the parietal bones make up the superior and part of the sides of the skull. So you want to recognize those sorts of descriptions and being able to get a mental picture of what that bone is. So review those notes. What else should you review while take, studying for your test? The other lectures. Um, I know what I taught you in class. You can expect that's what you're going to see on your test. Um, you wrote a personal description of our ever-growing vocabulary list, so recognizing those words will help you to identify them in the test. I've made many, like miniature seven-minute, eight-minute lectures for most of the topics from this unit, so you can go back to my YouTube channel and watch um, long bone, watch classification of joints, what have you. You have graphic organizers we did, um, functional structural classification of joints, which I remember doing a slide on, but now I don't remember talking about it. We did a practice test in class, or we're going to do a practice test in class. Your warm-ups. I'm trying to get you to practice skills that I'm going to ask you to perform on the test. So go back and look at those warm-ups and see what kind of things I asked you to do. The objectives is a multiple choice set of questions you did. You had a whole packet of them. So go back and look at those. Where do you think I get my multiple choice questions for? From many other resources, that being one of them. So not all of them, but some of them. So that's all I got for you today. Um, hopefully you've been studying all along the way and not waiting until the last minute to cram because that's really the best. If you know it, you don't have to study it. So I hope that has been helpful and you're going to do great. So good luck.